Sorry. It's an amazing opportunity to think about what this meeting gives us, uh, gives us compared to what a lot of the I meetings that we go to are like. Now, that's all, those are good, uh, but in some ways this has got a very unique um, place in what we as ophthalmologists, clinicians, mission uh, agencies, missionaries uh, have to, to experience. So I'm, I'm glad to begin this time and talk with you about um, a, a topic that's a, a, a bit difficult, and that is the, the issue of success. You know, when you think about when you think about missions, um, success is, you know, you try not to think too much about success. It's difficult. It's hard work. John's laughing because he knows, you know, what is success? Very, very difficult to come up with a way to really even uh, discuss this in a, in a way that I think can help us connect with what's really going on out there. One of the things that's a distinctive, uh, in other words, of this meeting is the chance to actually talk about what's real. Uh, what's really going on in the trenches when we deal with patients who really do have have issues not just medically but are impacted by their belief systems by the faith that they have or that they don't have as we talked about last night and this is a chance to uh, a meeting where we can dialogue about that put those ideas together and try to, to put them into practice in some way so these are what I'm going to talk with you about this morning are, are just some ideas to help us to, to kind of set the framework and for us to uh, move forward as we, in our discussions this week. A lot of the talks today are on development, on, on development of, uh, of missions and, the, and uh, the development of different ways of, of impacting our world. Engagement um, as the title of, uh, impacting our, our world as the title of this, uh, this session is. So it's a good opportunity to, to hopefully explore this with you a little bit. Uh, make sure I've got the right, yeah. So here's what we all want when you think about success. We probably all want something similar. We want to say we, we did lots of surgery. You know, we want to be out, if we're going to invest our time in uh, some sort of a mission program or a project, we want to say we've done lots of surgery, that we saw a lot of people, that, that um, we impacted their belief system, that they maybe came to the Lord or they maybe had some new way of looking at where they are on their faith journey. Uh, we want everything to go according to at least some sort of plan, maybe not a perfect plan, but at least there's some sense that, yeah, we kind of went like we thought, and uh, we established some good relationships, um, and maybe my life was changed, too. Uh, so when we come back, we think, that was a success. It really impacted me. And we saw people that were so grateful, and, and uh, you know, that, that you know, compared to what we deal with in our, our practices day to day, sometimes it gets a little old when you have people who don't like what you did for them. Uh, but when you're out doing one of these projects, oftentimes it's quite the opposite. They're very grateful uh, for what we bring. So that's really wonderful. And then last, uh, you know, we, we survived. Uh, you know, even that is a success. You know, we, we made it. Uh, we, all, we all went. We all came back. Uh, it's a good thing. You know, we're, we were there and we helped a few people in the process. And not only that, maybe we've got some extra money left. We can do this again. That's the bonus. So that's what we'd all like. But here's what uh, sometimes we get. Um, we thought we were going to do a lot of cases, but they only found a few. They just didn't tell you until you showed up, and there was only five. You know, there was supposed to be 500, but well, you know, there were problems, and the weather was better, whatever. So there was only five, and we really didn't see anybody impacted. You know, we don't know if that it really had made any difference at all in what they believed. And our our plan was, we thought, a good one, but it really didn't jive with what they thought was going to happen, and it completely fell apart. And our main contacts really only seemed interested in our money. By the time we got there, it sounded like they were really interested in what we were doing, but really they just had their hand out, and this was the chance for us to, uh, to make that personal connection so we could give them something else. And I came back actually not built up. I came back pretty bummed. I came back discouraged by the whole thing. And the people really didn't seem all that grateful, as a matter of fact. They kind of were disappointed. Uh, that we didn't do more. You I mean this is it? This is all you came to do? What about this? What about that? Um, and we lost a team member maybe and had to leave early and I don't mean necessarily lost like died but you know even though I've had that happen um, so it's no laughing matter actually when you think about the seriousness of some of these situations and we don't have the resources to do this again. 
that hopefully no one has had all those bad things happen at the same time. <laughs> uh, you know, but uh, sorry if it has happened to you. All of those things come together in one giant, colossal, terrible, no good, very bad mission trip. Uh, you know, that's, that can happen. But most of the time, we experience something that doesn't go according to plan. And so we're left with this dilemma. When we get back, we want to report. You know, we got to tell everybody, oh, here's what we did. Uh, we had, this is, this is the report we want to give, but this is something on this list is the report that we really ought to actually give, and that's not the one that we want to give. So we're kind of in this dilemma sometimes about how do we honestly and realistically represent what we've done and still make it clear that this is something that, that uh, we feel compelled to do, it's something that God wants us to do. So I want to talk to you about the optics of a mission program. Uh, you know, how do we look at these things? Through what lens can you look at what you're doing and kind of put in perspective maybe the success, not just in terms of immediate achievements and immediate problems or challenges that you had, but kind of stand back a little bit and take a look at it um, through these optics. Uh, the first one uh, is to think of the mission program as, uh, you can think of it as being a durable prog uh, uh, progress, uh, durable progress or a durable program. Could be sustainable, might be scalable, or might be missional. Those are kind of the four categories I would challenge you to think about uh, with me a little bit this morning. So when you're looking at whatever it is you're doing or whatever you're thinking about doing, there might be four categories that you could consider. The durable category means that it's something that's had a proven ability to survive. Lots of programs out there like this. Uh, they're really driven by a personality. It's someone's passion to do such and such. And um, may not be any more than that, but it survived for a long period of time because it was driven by that person. Uh, so it, it, it holds on. Um, as soon as that person is gone, oh, you can imagine that's, that's kind of the end of that program. That's okay. That doesn't mean that bad. I'm just saying that's one optic with which you can look at a program. Secondly, you might see it as something that is sustainable. That is, not only did it, did it survive, but it actually was thriving. It actually moved forward. You could see that there was growth. Uh, and the, so the main metric uh, is, is economics, that there was enough, you know, um, trade happening within the program, you know, patients were paying something or, or however you want to look at that, uh, that the, economically it was something that could continue on. It usually involves a broader base of local leadership. So it's, it's no longer just that one guy or one lady that's driving this, this project. Now it's something about a bigger picture, something about a shared vision with others. And hopefully, oftentimes, that's people that are local to wherever the project is going on. Uh, third, you might think of a, a scalable project. This one now is not just thriving, uh, but you can see that it you could actually multiply it. Uh, I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in a minute, because in some ways this has kind of become the gold standard, so to speak, for mission programs. If you talk out, if you're out there talking in the, you know, the health community, the developmental community, or the NGO community, and you know what they what they want to know is that either it's sustainable or it's scalable. One of those two. If it's not those two, then it doesn't quite, you know, it's not quite there. I don't agree with that. I'm just saying that these are the way that people kind of look at these things. And when I say driven by industry, what I mean is that now that you've you've taken a a single thriving project and you've taken it to another level, you've gone to scale with it. Now there's an infrastructure that's required. There's something more involved to get that to keep going. That's what I mean by industry. So I'm not talking about you know, becoming a, you know, a, a company necessarily. I'm just saying that, that it's, it's more an industrial process now. It's more driven by that industrial process. Missional, uh, the last one. Um, this is a, the, the, something that sh shows up in, that's proven it's a proven ability to love. I didn't know how else to say it, <laughs> but it's a, it's, a, it's a way of looking at a project through the eyes of what its character is like, not the economics of it. So durable, sustainable, scalable are all in some ways connected to industry uh, or economics in some ways and personalities. Missional, the missional uh, optic is about looking at these programs or looking at your project or program uh, through the character, the eyes of the character that that project has. And so I'd say proven ability love. The main metric is its character, and it's driven really by a shared conviction now. Now it's not just a, a, a shared idea of what you want to accomplish. 
Now it's about sharing that conviction uh, with others. So I want to talk about uh, that a little bit more. Let me just, uh, as an aside quickly, and that is personal success really is different than program success. So I mentioned that earlier, you know, we'd all like to come back and say, look, this affected me. Uh, and regardless of whatever else happened, I was impacted positively by this. And that's a good thing, but um, you would, no one would disagree that that's a, that's a good thing to do. But we need to be careful. What I'm talking about right now is not that side of it. I'm just talking about uh, the idea of program success. How do we measure or how would we, what are the hallmarks of program success? So I just wanted to be sure that's clear to you. I mentioned that sustainability is uh, kind of uh, become kind of one of those uh, catch words, one of those words that's thrown around all the time. If a program is not sustainable, then it doesn't measure up, basically. It's usually taken to mean financial independence and includes some, uh, some amount of local leadership that's involved, as I said a minute ago. And so we all think that that must be good, just by, you know, we all default to that idea that we're talking about something that this, this must be the way it should be done. Uh, and it seems to really have become the standard for success in the, the humanitarian effort or the, the world of humanitarian service. I want to challenge that a little bit, but let me show you an example. This was from Dr. Bedenz's uh, presentation a couple of years ago uh, with his permission to, to talk about his, the right to site model. And so they talked about how important it was to have a sustainable model. High quality surgery and eye care uh, with support systems produced high volume that generated income that then was used to subsidize those who had no funds. It's the Irvin model, it's lots of people have used that, that model. And they said what takes, what requires is you've got to have good surgeons, you need to train them properly, you have to have good management and the community health worker training to, to mobilize the patients, and then you provide the equipment. Uh, so it's, you know, it, it's a doable thing, um, but I want to take a closer look at it for just a minute. Look at what, it, what, what sustainability means. This is from uh, Mogadal, he's kind of considered like a, um, you know, the father of sustainability, so to speak. He wrote a number of articles in the textbook about this topic, and it was he kind of launched the whole sustainability idea back in 1994. The long-term ability to mobilize and allocate sufficient resources for activities that meet individual or public health needs. So it's the long-term ability part of it that makes it sustainable, and it's about meeting those needs. So in, I, just to be kind of the advocatus diaboli here, so to speak, uh, that, that really means that we're doing everything we can right now so that we really don't need to help them in the future, <laughs> which to me gives it a little bit of a different feel. Let's make sure that you know we're in and out of there as fast as we can. We really don't want to be too connected. We just want to be connected enough to get them going, get someone going, and then we want to, want to get out. Uh, so that's kind of what it, uh, what the idea is. Dr. Bruce Steff is a good friend of mine, and and he and I have spent long hours, you know, solving world problems and all that, like a, a lot of us have sat around and done, and uh, you know, never works, of course. But but it's great to sit and think about these things, and and he kind of got me thinking about this a great deal. Uh, he's the uh, CEO and the director of a program called PAX, Pan American Association of Christ Christian Surgeons, a very well respected program and a part of the CMDA project actually. And he said, uh, he said it this way, Sustain sustainability is a secular concept uh, based on striving for independence and autonomy. And he sees it actually as an example of Western syncretism. Uh, it's trying to make our values fit somebody else's way of doing things is how it's so you know it's it's interesting to think that you know we, we need to be careful when we assign success as one specific thing and not really think about it i just want us to think about it is all i'm saying so what are the program hallmarks of a success well let's let's take a minute to step back to our a lot of us have a christian heritage in here or a legacy that goes back in the christian faith and think about how maybe god did this because he actually did um, he, uh, he uh, established a durable mission program. He sent uh, Jesus, at least that's how we would look at it. We sent Jesus as his ambassador, as his son, to deliver a message. And that message was to be durable for all, all time. And it was going to be sustainable because he trained 12 guys. Uh, that, and then, you know, it's in, uh, including uh, Paul, the apostle, to go out and carry this on. So it was going to be durable. 
he had, a, he, had, he had handed it off to the small group of people that were going to make it possible to continue. Uh, he made it scalable because uh, he added an, an ingredient that uh, was very unique at that time. Remember, everything in the religious world was all about tribes and nations. You know, it was the nation of Israel. It was the tribe of Levi that was the priest. It was all about nations and, 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 uh, and, um, and tribes. And he added a new ingredient that said, look, it's not just about, it's not about nations anymore. It's about individuals and then coming together in a unique way. And he made that possible by, say, by creating this concept of what we call the body of Christ or the church. Um, it's bringing together extremely diverse now, not all Jewish, not all whatever. It's not national or tribal. Now it's about extreme diversity coming together into one unified group. That means he created a scalable system. And he provided a, ma a missional foundation. What are the two great commandments? Everybody knows to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. That's the missional foundation that we all live with. So God built this mission program that has survived to this day and has flourished um, by progressing, delivering this missional foundation, providing the, the gift of his son for the startup, and delivering that to the set of disciples for growth so that it could become a scalable impact for the whole world. That's a great model, I think, uh, for success, what success looks like. But we have a problem when it gets to this piece right here the growth and the impact. We can do stuff about this. That's our job. But it seems like this part of it is a little harder to deal with. So we can develop a foundation. We can build a good foundation. We can provide a durable startup. You know, we can be that person that holds it up, even when times are tough, that can keep things going. But when it comes to growth, there's, there's, that's not so easy you know, to say that we're the ones who've done that, or that somehow we can control that, or somehow we can make that happen. And certainly in terms of impact, very hard to say uh, that you know, we have anything that we can directly do that's going to make that happen. So I like to see it as two jobs that are working side by side. Our job and God's job. He's working side by side with us. And that's the partnership we were talking about last night some also. So it begins with us doing our job well. Uh, make sure we establish the foundation. Uh, let's talk about that for a minute. And I want to give you a concept that hopefully will help you um, as you think about these issues. First, uh, the idea of flexibility, being responsive to, to varying conditions, uh, allowing for unknowns uh, that are part of every project. Develop a sense of, a, 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 so develop a sense of flexibility, an, an idea of flexibility. Develop a sense of accountability. Uh, that is the willingness for audit, for actual real evaluation of what you're doing and how it's going. And not the illusions that we sometimes want to live with, but the reality of what's there. And then be careful to always provide some kind of follow-up. Do it with integrity. Uh, remember that consistency is important. Uh, people will know if you're consistent with what you say, what you do, and then uh, what you believe. I like to think of it as wearing one hat. Uh, to me, I could summarize last, last night's talk and say, well, we should all wear one hat. <laughs> we ought to have on our, our hat of being a, a Jesus follower all the time. You just put the hat on, you leave it on. That's it. Uh, that kind of pretty well takes care of the whole picture. So I know that's simplistic, but it kind of takes care of the whole picture for me in some ways. Uh, behave the same. You know, if you do, if you have like, okay, I'm going to go out and do missions now, and uh, you know, so you leave your office, and now you're a certain way out here, and when you come back to the office, everyone at your office is, oh my gosh, he's, he's coming back. <laughs> it was so nice when he was away. You know, now he's coming back, or she's coming back, and I, okay, everybody, hold on. You know, it's going to be <laughs> it's going to be one of those days. He's going to be upset because now he's overworked because he was on his mission trip, and now he's really frustrated because there's too many patients waiting, and don't don't do that. You see that just you just shot yourself in the foot. Seriously, you know when that happens, and um, be careful that you keep that hat on all the time, and you don't just selectively wear your hat when it seems like a good idea to you. Um, be sure that you always involve a team. You've got to have mutual support. My wife and I left practice 2004, and we had determined that we would not go into full-time mission work unless there was a team that went with us. 
we would, would not do it any other way. And so, uh, and I even heard uh, last night, he said, do you have someone praying for you in your practice today for those patients that you're going to see? What that means is he's got a team. Walt has a team that works with him. I don't know who the team is and how he developed it exactly, but I can guarantee you he has a team of people that are working with him because of what he said. It's the same for everything. We ought to have a team concept in what we do, a community of involvement, not just the Lone Ranger going out there to do that. That, that has worked very well for us over the years. So it gives us a chance to uh, live the principle that a project is always more than the sum of its parts, or it should be. Um, that's the concept here. And lastly, uh, honesty. Be sure that you stay honest about the finances and in your messaging about what you're doing. So this is a faith foundation, I would call it, F-A-I-T-H. It may be an easy way to hang on to these, you know, these uh, five principles. And regardless of whether you're Christian, not Christian, what your background or what your heritage is, most of us share a, a Christian heritage here, but not all. And regardless, though, of what it is, everybody, I think, needs faith involved in what we do. If we heard anything last night, it was that, look, um, I, I don't care who we are, we are wired as human beings to need some element of faith in our lives. And uh, it's always just a matter of exploring where, that, where that's headed, and we're on that journey to explore that. So these are the five things. Faith, accountability, integrity, team, and honesty. And I encourage you to just uh, use that as a way of uh, thinking about the foundation that you would build. And by the way, there is a strong correlation between this kind of a foundation and what we could all say is success. A durable startup, uh, just quickly be, be ready and able to be the person for the program. Uh, that means somebody needs to have that level of commitment that will carry it through. I see this in people who have things going you know, all, uh, all the time. Uh, the, the, the ones that seem to make it are the ones that have that strong, there's someone there that's a champion. There's someone there that's got a strong commitment. You may be that person. But at the same time that you're being a champion, you need to be ready to be a follower. There's a real paradox here, right? Just because you're the champion doesn't mean, you know, you're the evil can evil guy. You know, you're like, and, you know, everybody know you had to care, could care less about what anybody else is saying or what the bigger picture is. That's not what I mean. So it's a, at the one hand being a follower and the other hand being the champion. And those two things actually work exactly together. Uh, be ready to articulate a vision and set a direction. Even if you don't know all the facts, that's okay. Because it, you, you won't know all the facts. We're limited. Uh, just by definition of being human, we're limited. So uh, set a direction even if you don't know all the facts and be, and be prepared uh, to take a risk. Uh, technically, maybe. Financially, spiritually, there's some risk involved if you're going to do some kind of a program. Uh, I can assure you. You can maybe pretend there isn't and try to minimize that, but I can tell you there will always be some risk. So once you've developed that and built a foundation, then our only, the only thing needed for success, I would say, is that your person is willing to stay on that path. Because once you're on that path, granted it's a fairly narrow path, but once you're on it, I really believe that that's when we see things happen. That's when the parts of this that we can't control come into play. That's when the story that's bigger than us comes into play. That's when all the things that have been happening on the, around us that we didn't even know about suddenly show up. Maybe a little bit at a time, maybe in a big way. But they show up and help us direct what we're doing. My personal scorecard, I uh, said, is one of my objectives for this talk to, to kind of give you a scorecard. How do I know that I'm still on that path? So I've done the hard work, I've, I've established the foundation, I've, I've, I've uh, been willing to be a champion and be a follower. How do I know that I'm on that path still? So this is my scorecard uh, for, for whatever it's worth for you to look at. So am I uh, meeting the goals of those in authority? As I said, I can be a champion, but I also have to be a follower at the same time. So am I meeting the goals of those who are in authority? Do I see people embracing the unexpected joyfully? There's something about that that tells you a lot about the chemistry of what's happening. That, su that surprises are, are not, ex are not um, encountered with fear and with uh, anxiety uh, and with reluctance. They're embraced with, uh, with joy and with expectation that something new is happening. 
not something bad, <laughs> which is kind of sometimes what it might look like, but something new is happening. Do I see be people being treated with respect? That tells me a lot about the chemistry of the team that I'm work working with. How do they treat each other? How do they see me treating them? How do they treat me? How do they treat the patients? So I, looked for, I look for respect. That's an important part of the scorecard for me. Is there a sense of community? In other words, is there, is there a sense that, okay, I've done my job and I'm going home. That's it, I'm done. Uh, or is there more of a sense of, look, this is like, uh, you could use the word family, perhaps. It doesn't mean you have to all be best friends. That's not what I mean. But there's a real sense that this is more than just a job that we do together. There's a real community that's engaging in this work together. I find that to be a very important element uh, for success and knowing that I'm still on that path. Do I see examples of sacrificial living uh, in, the, in myself and in those I'm working with? Those little stories that you see of somebody that did something unexpected, you know, that, that took care of a patient in a way that they didn't have to, but they went one extra step. Those little, uh, I think uh, maybe we could use the word faith flags like we were talking about last night. Those little things, those little things that, that stand out and you can say, hey, these are unique things that are telling us something about, about the dynamics of what God is doing here, what this team is like, what this program is about. I see evidence of that in the sacrificial living of people who are involved, not just in myself. Do I hear a point in time thinking? By that, you may not, and I use that term all the time. What I mean by that is uh, that there's a sense that this is a time, space, you know, limited thing. This is not about eternity. This is about a program I'm doing right now. This is a season. Sometimes we might use the word season. This is a season of our life. This is what we're doing this season. And I don't know how long this season will be or how short it'll be, but it's a season. And what that does is gives me a sense of perspective. It keeps me from thinking too big and too small about what this is. It kind of keeps it in perspective. I find that very helpful for me personally. And when I hear it in other people in the team, uh, it's not a, it's not fatalism. It's not that, oh, well, we'll be, you know, this will only go on for a little while anyway. That's not what I mean. It's more the sense that there's something special happening right now and I'm part of it. And it's that happening right now part. That's the little cue that they've got this kind of a point in time thinking. I find that to be very useful. Do I see people accomplishing more than they thought possible? I love this one. This one is actually kind of my thing. <laughs> This is what keeps me going more than anything else. It's when people who didn't think they could do it, do it. It's when people who come together in a way that they didn't think possible, becomes possible. And they can't explain it. They can't say, how could, how did, huh? You know, it's that, that look you like, I, I don't know how we just did that. It's the looking behind you and saying, wow, <laughs> that was incredible. How did we do that? Like, so, exactly. How did we do that? I don't know. That's what turns me on. Everything from directing youth choirs to, you know, to running I teams. I've done them all. And they all have that one thing. It's, you know, it's that, that group coming together in a way that they accomplished something they didn't think possible. I've always told my wife, I would love to be a conductor. That's all I want. I just want to be a conductor. I'll be happy with that, too. Are donors buying into the mission as a partner? I think this is an important one because it tells you a lot about how you're relating to those who are supporting you. Uh, so by donors, I, I mean, I should have used the word supporters, really. It's a little broader than donors. It's a sense that are those that are working with you actually catching what and why uh, you're doing. They may not understand how. They may not have the technical side of it. That's fine. But they at least need to really understand what and why you're doing what you're doing. When they understand that, oftentimes you'll find those that are more than just financial donors. There are people who are willing to, to actually support um, prayer. We talked about that last night. Uh, sometimes they'll come and be part of the team for you know, a short time or whatever. Or, there are various ways that people, you don't know how those people that are around you, that circle of people around you, might be ready to engage. You don't know what's going on in their life. But this may be the opportunity, once they really see what and why you're doing, you may be that spark for them. You have no idea, but you may be. And this is an important clue to watch for that tells you, I'm relating to them in a way that might ignite their heart and their interest in what we're doing. Do I see uh, independent, interdependence with other efforts? I've been in the mission field uh, about 10 years now. And I tell you, this is one of the hardest ones. 
everybody wants to do their own thing. Everybody is locked into a little, you know, alleyway of, you know, keeping their eyes, eyes, uh, you know, on on the goal. And 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 I understand that I really do because it's very difficult. The the circumstances are hard. It's hard enough just to keep your own thing going. It's, you know, there's a lot of people here who could who know what I'm talking about. But let me just challenge you that one of the things on my scorecard is the, this is on my scorecard because it tells me something about how I'm relating to the bigger picture around me. Am I even willing to relate to the bigger picture around me? Because there's a lot more to the picture than me. And this tells me that I'm really willing to do that, that I'm actually practically, purposefully willing to do that. So you can see each of these things, each of these things tells me something. That's why it's on my scorecard. Each of those things tell me something about how I'm relating to, uh, to others, to God, to the team, to patients, to donors. It, it, it brings that whole thing together, and I find it to be a very helpful way to judge if I'm still on the path. And that's the closest I can come to talking about success, really. Success to me, it means I'm staying on the path. That's about the best I can do. So uh, hopefully that's not too disappointing. <laughs> know that he, I went through all this just to tell you, well, it's really just about staying on the path. That's really about the best you can do to know that you're, that you're on a, the hallmark of success is that you're on the path. And to me, this is a good way to defining what that path uh, looks like. So some warning signs just to conclude, uh, magical thinking. Um, that's the whole, if I just wait, you know, God will provide. It will rain out of the heavens on me, on me because I am so sincere, because I am so committed, because I am such a wonderful doctor, because, because, because we have all sorts of things that, you know, we really want to think that if we do it right and if we do it with integrity, it'll be there. And sometimes it is, but it's a little, bit, to me, it's a little scary when I hear that kind of thinking. Because to me, it's not about the, the fruit necessarily. It's about the faithfulness in staying on the path. And that means I don't know where the path is going. <laughs> and whether that path is going to be strewn with problems, it probably will be. But as long as I stay on the path, I'm OK. Um, so magical thinking is dangerous, I think. Sometimes you hear exaggeration, you know, um, in, about the impact. You know, this is going to change the world. It's going to, you know, and, and I understand the hope that we need to have to even be able to do this. That's not what I'm talking about. It's when we start to flop over, flip over into saying that what we've hoped for now has somehow, somehow become what's real, when it's really still just what you're hoping for. Just be careful about that. Uh, and always keep a hand on a handle on what the actual results are, so you can be honest about that. When you see people not planning, when you see lack of financial honesty, when I see those things, I'm really quite concerned because it, you know, being on a spiritual path doesn't mean lack of doesn't mean you'd stop planning. Doesn't mean finances aren't a real issue. They are. Uh, the, the sort of the independent mode to me is a little worrisome when I hear that. Or if there's lack of accountability, people doing things without any, any awareness of what they've done at all. Uh, they just know that they went and uh, they conquered. <laughs> you know, they came, they conquered, and they came home. You know, that, that's kind of how they see it. That's not what we're talking about. That's very worrisome when that happens. I love this quote. Uh, I was... Uh, uh, a pastor, actually, some years back, and uh, there was a professor from a seminary that that came. Um, professor Dibler was his name. He was this fellow who was about my age, but he looked terribly old at the time, I must say. And now I'm thinking, oh my gosh, how do I look to you guys? I must look terribly old also, because <laughs> I remember what he looked like. And uh, and he got up one Sunday and he said, here's my, and he, he was coming to, to help me, really, with this little church I was in. And he said, here's my sermon for the day. And he got up and he was very, you know, one of those guys that you just, oh, you know, you just you want to listen, you're all ears and you're ready. And he says, expect great things of God. Attempt great things for God. Amen. And he sat down. And that was it. <laughs> that was his whole sermon. And I tell you, that's the one sermon of all the sermons I've ever heard, which have been thousands. That's the only sermon I remember. <laughs> so maybe that's a lesson, too. It's a good short, <laughs> perhaps.
too long today, uh, but this was, a, to me, was a great example of, of the willingness uh, that we need to have to step outside. You know, you hear the term comfort zone all the time, but let me just challenge you to say that, that uh, unless you're willing to just be a little outside that comfort zone, you don't have to be far outside it, but if, you're, if you stay inside, I can assure you that there'll be very little chance to really make a difference. If you're on just just outside it, maybe you're way outside it. When we, when we left our practice in 2004, uh, I felt like I was going into the dark, like into no man's land. It was quite a scary thing for us. Uh, but uh, it doesn't have to be that drastic. But if you're just a little outside it, I think you'll find uh, that's where you can make a difference. So I just ask you today to consider, uh, are you far enough outside to make a difference or not? And um, maybe we can end with that. Uh